Please be seated. On behalf of the Presbyterian Church in America and the Board of Trustees of Covenant College, I welcome you to the inauguration of the sixth president of Covenant College. Welcome to a beautiful morning in a beautiful place and a beautiful point in the history of Covenant College. Thanks for your willingness to come and be a part and sharing in what will be a wonderful celebration, and I thank you again for your attending. I'm now going to introduce to you Dr. Jeff Hall, who is the Vice President of Academic Affairs, who will deliver our invocation this morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, sweet Savior of our souls in the presence of a spirit of grace, please make your presence known among us now. We have promised, you have promised, that where we gather, you will join us. We aspire to your service, but know that without your aid, we are without hope. Visit us now that we may know your sweet communion during this celebration of your kind providence. We reflect over the history of this college and testify to your faithfulness and goodness in times of plenty and in times of want. By your grace, you have shaped eternities while we have witnessed transformations in the lives of individuals. Your will be done, your kingdom come. Today we gather to celebrate and dedicate a special providence, our new president, Dr. Derek Halverson. Although you have employed human means to bring him and his family into our community, we acknowledge that unless you build the house, its builders labor in vain. By your grace, please continue to use him and his to provide leadership, encouragement, exhortation, and inspiration to Covenant College. We confess our utter dependence on you and pray your presence with us, Emmanuel, especially at this point of beginning, at this inauguration. Through your grace and mercy, continue your work in us through this service that we may honor you as your faithful handiwork, continually conforming our lives individually to the likeness of your son that corporately we may be his true bride. We humbly ask this in the sweet name of Jesus, who is our means of grace and our hope of glory. Amen.
Thank you. Uh, please join me in a congregational pr prayer for our president. This is, uh, was written by our, our own professor, Dr. William Tate, professor of English. I will be reading the light font, and you will please respond with the uh, dark font. Trustees and students, alumni and administrators, staff and faculty, and friends of Covenant College, we meet today in community to instill Derek Halverson as the sixth president of the college. We meet confident that you have called him to this place and for this time, yet also aware, as he is surely aware, that all flesh is frail, that all of our strivings are in vain apart from your grace. And so we pray. Father of all mercies, pour out your grace on this man today. Strengthen him in him those good gifts which you have given him in preparing him for this calling. We confess, Father, that we are sinful by your spirit developed in President Halverson in all of us a readiness to confess our sin and to repent. Confirm President Halverson in love for your holy word. Let him delight in your testimonies. Because the best are those who keep your testimonies and seek you wholeheartedly. May he hold firm to the trustworthy word which your spirit has taught. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who are not Because he is your steward, grant him holiness so that, he, that his life may be above approach. Protect him from arrogance and the good temper, and make him hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Give him compassion for those he leads based in his understanding that, like them, he is frail. Grant him humility so that he is concerned not only with his own interests, but also with the interests of others. We pray also for ourselves, those of us who serve with President Halverson as trustees, faculty, administrators, staff, and students. Help us to support him with our prayers, in our attitudes, and in our words and actions, so that our labor together may please you. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Derek, you've always been a natural leader, starting with your leadership role as the oldest of the four Halverson boys. You set the precedent for our family when you decided to attend Covenant College. In fact, our mom and dad were so enthusiastic about your decision to attend Covenant that when it came time for me to choose a college, they offered me a deal that I couldn't refuse. Apparently, they also offered the same deal to our two younger brothers. What is it that attracted you so much to Covenant? It wasn't one single thing. I remember very clearly when you came home on vacation from college and your endless discussion about the great things at Covenant, the incredible philosophy class with Dr. McClellan, the mind-expanding history class with Dr. Boskel, the guys on the soccer team, Coach Crossman, worship as a community, and so on. It went on and on. For you, Covenant, was the entire package. I speak not only for myself, but for my brothers, for my wife, for my former classmates, for my teammates on the soccer team, and for many Covenant College students of past generations. Covenant was all that. Besides myself, I could easily point to a dozen men and women in this audience for whom Covenant fundamentally changed their lives for the better. So what, again, was it that Covenant had going for it? Let me be brutally honest. It wasn't that it had a lot of money. By the standards of today's universities, Covenant's endowment was pitiful. It also didn't have many books in its library, nor did it have a very wide range of academic majors. For example, it had no philosophy major, had no mathematics major, had no German major. 
In fact, you'll probably remember that I used to drive down twice a week to UTC in order to take German classes. What Covenant did have going for it, first of all, was a good overall philosophy of education that unified the diverse activities that make up the life of a college. Some universities aim for excellence, and I applaud that. As people say about getting old, it beats the alternative. But I'm wondering, I'm left wondering what they mean by the word excellence. Surely one can be an excellent gambler or an excellent thief, but if our, college produ if our colleges produced such people, would we have achieved our goals? Unlike some universities, Covenant College has a clearly articulated goal and one that makes philosophical and theological sense. Second, Covenant College had excellent professors. Not only were they excellent teachers in the classroom, they were also exemplars of how to integrate faith and life. Third, Covenant had a critical mass of high quality students who came to challenge each other and to get the most they could out of the resources that Covenant did have to offer. I want to remind you that a college is made out of its students. And no matter what resources a college has, having great students is crucial to its fulfilling its mission. I want to thank the former, former president of the college, Frank Brock, his administration, and everyone else who contributed to that atmosphere that we experienced firsthand at Covenant College in the early 1990s. And Derek, I charge you to perpetuate that atmosphere, an atmosphere whose parallel I've never yet experienced at any other American institution of higher education. But again, to be honest, while the Covenant College of the 1990s had something unique, it still could have been better. How could it have been better? Let's start with the obvious things. If Covenant had had a lar larger endowment, then it could have better achieved its educational aims. To be more specific, with greater financial resources, Covenant could have offered a more comprehensive curriculum. Similarly, with greater resources, Covenant could have provided its faculty with time away from, the classroom, from classroom teaching in order to put their good ideas down on paper, to disseminate them to a wider audience, and also to bring back their new ideas into the classroom. In conclusion, I'm simply delighted to see you combining your natural leadership skills with your passion for the mission of Covenant College. I'm delighted also for future generations of Covenant College students because you truly get the idea of covenant. But I want to remind you that God himself is not satisfied with, quote unquote, preservation of value. By my admittedly loose reading of the parable of the talents, God calls us not just to be stewards of what he has given us, but to become co-creators with him. I charge you then to work together with the board of trustees, with your staff and with faculty to co-create Covenant, to make it to some, into something even better than what we experienced. Thank you. On behalf of the student body of Covenant College, I'm delighted to offer our welcome to Dr. Derek Halverson. We are thrilled to have you here, especially in light of the fact that you graduated from the place that we're all working on graduating from, that you love this mountain, you love this school, and most importantly, you love the Lord. Our charge to you is first and foremost to never take a step away from the mission and vision of Covenant College. Treasure it and hold firm to it, whatever the cost. That mission of exploring and expressing the preeminence of Christ in all things that's worth the highest sacrifice imaginable. And our charge is to willingly give the sacrifice it takes to preserve and protect that basic foundation so that Covenant continues to be a place that equips biblically grounded young men and women to live out extraordinary callings in ordinary places. That is so that we, the students, would graduate equipped to advance Christ's kingdom and to serve wherever we go in a Christ-like way with our identity firmly rooted in him. Secondly, our charge to you is to lead by example, as a loving father, son, and brother who speaks the truth in love. As a scholar who diligently wrestles through tough questions, pushes himself outside of his comfort zone. As a church member who participates faithfully, serves humbly, gives generously within the body of Christ. And as an alumnus who continues to give and to invest and to serve. And finally, our charge to you is to challenge us as students 
challenge us to guard the mission of covenant, to protect it, to make sacrifices for it. Beyond that, challenge us to recognize that we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared for us. Challenge us to work hard, to study hard, to pray hard. Challenge us, even and especially when we're tired and busy, to open our minds to grasp, grasp concepts of science and philosophy and theology, and to see the intricate connections between them, and to not take covenant for granted, the opportunity to sit in classes with this incredible faculty, and to sit in chapel at least three days a week, sitting in front of the words, ask of me and I shall give thee the nations. Challenge us to not take that opportunity for granted. Encourage us and all members of this community to expand our perspective and to hold a right view of ourselves as sinful, redeemed, and loved human beings here on earth for a short time, tasked to build Christ's kingdom until he comes again. Encourage us to keep that perspective in mind, that we dwell in a flood of unending grace destined for glory. Our charge is to direct students here to live in that reality. President Halverson, the charge from the faculty is $225 million. <laughs> uh, this is the amount of money we'd like to have in our endowment, and uh, there's a story behind the amount, but I won't go into it. Uh, we, we know that Jesus Christ commanded us to ask for our daily bread, but we don't see what would be wrong with also owning the bakery. Uh, uh, I think it was last April you came and uh, spoke to the, the faculty and you said that your dream job was to replace Lou Voskel. President Halverson, I served with Lou Voskel. <laughs> Lou Voskel is a friend of mine. <laughs> President Halverson, you're no Lou Voskel. <laughs> First of all, you're not Dutch. <laughs> and secondly, you are much too expressive when you speak. Uh, I've noticed you move your eyebrows. Uh, uh, and beside that, we've already hired his replacement. And so you are stuck with the job of being the leader of this college. So we have various things that we would like to charge you to do. First of all, you may know that the faculty that you are joining is a very conservative faculty, at least when it comes to education. So we would like you to help us to continue to have the freedom to think inside the box. To be more specific, help us to resist any, any sort of educational entrepreneurship, efficiency, or innovation that would weaken the quality of a covenant education. May the students who are here now and here during your tenure and the students who, are follow, who follow them enjoy the sort of education that you had, an education marked by classroom teaching, by careful thought, and by friendly discussion. Always remember the command of your leader, who said, as we will, as we will sing, lead on, O King Eternal, uh, the leader who said that, the, that he who would be first must be last of all and the servant of all. Thank you for coming back to serve us. And thank you, too, for your appreciation for your education, your support of us, and the nice things that you say about us in many venues to many people. Uh, we will do our best to follow you as you follow God, to submit ourselves to your leadership as you lead us under him. Uh, we appreciate all that you've done and all that you will do. Thank you for coming back to serve us. In Jesus' name. Dr. Halverson, it's my privilege to charge you on behalf of our parent denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, and I have the privilege 
uh, to uh, humbly serve as its moderator this year. Long after I am no longer the moderator, you will still be the president. And so I remind you this morning of um, what esteem and affection our denomination holds for you and how glad we are that you are the new president of our school. Um, I think of Derek, if I can call him that, as a son who is coming home. He is a son of the church. By that I mean not only the Presbyterian Church in America, but the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he is a son of Christ Covenant Church that I have the privilege now to be the senior pastor at. Fortunately for Derek, I was not the senior pastor while he was growing up, or he wouldn't be here today. Better men have invested in his life and shaped him theologically and ecclesiastically into the person he is today. He is a son of this institution, having been shaped by the men uh, sitting to my right and your left. He is a student here, was a student here, and then on the staff here, and now he comes to be the leader. He is a son coming home. And he is the son of a wonderful family. I count it a privilege and a blessing to be personal friends with his dad, Steve, and his mother, Marnie, who served both as uh, the headmaster of our school uh, until recently and an elder on our session and have helped me a great deal in my uh, orientation and leadership at Christ Covenant Church. I know they're bursting with pride today, and I know his three brothers, Hans and Kurt and Hoyt, even though some couldn't be here, hold him uh, in great affection. They love him with a love incorruptible, and they are very, very proud of the man he is today. So I congratulate you all. Uh, it is my task to remind you and to charge you, Derek, with what is important to the church. And I know that endowments are important, uh, and faculty is important. And buildings, and even I guess college trophies for athletic events have some significance. But I would like to take just a few moments to paint the broader and the bigger picture. What is important in this institution is the product that we produce. And what we send out into the world to be an influence for Jesus Christ. As I was listening to the presidential debates the other uh, night, it struck me as that these two men who will, one of them, be leading our nation for the next four years or longer were college students just three decades ago. And as I listened to President Obama and Mr. Romney, I heard streams of thought and values and beliefs coming into their comments and into their, their vision for our nation as a future, visions and thoughts from their family. They both spoke from their church background, things that their ministers had taught them, that the congregations they had lived in as a Christian and as a Mormon, how that had influenced their life. But I thought most of all, as I listened to them, they spoke from their university backgrounds, from things they had learned from presidents and professors and perhaps even from trustees. And I thought to myself, the young people listening to us this morning will in three decades be leading all of the institutions and organizations of our beloved homeland. And so that is the charge that we want you to focus on, Derek, and that is what kind of young men and women you unleash on the world after they have left Covenant College. I would read to you briefly from a Psalm of David, we believe written when he was an old man a prayer for the blessing of his people. And towards the end of Psalm 144, this is what he prays. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands into our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in any of our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings belong. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. As this king, this president, prayed for his nation, the first thing he prayed for were young men and women. Young men, he said, who would be like plants that were full-grown, 
I think he means by that men who had taken root in the soil of Psalm 1, who were filled with the sap of God's grace, who spread out their boughs and their, their vines and took possession of the creation that God had given them for the purposes of the Lord and bore much, much fruit. Something about a plant that is noble. It gives its life, its very life juice for the fruit that it produces. And that is what a real man does. He gives his life for the people he brings into the world that he cares for, that are under the shade of his protection and leadership. That is what a godly man does. We hope a young man from Covenant College. May your daughters, he says, be like pillars, corner pillars, cut for a palace. In the ancient world, virtue was always pictured as a female. The four classical virtues of uh, justice and prudence and temperance and courage are all figured in the form of female uh, personages or goddesses. And they were usually on the corner of palaces and temples because in the ancient way of thinking, it was the virtue of women that held up the nobility of society. Women who, as commentators said, were both statuesque and stately, slim of figure, noble in character, beautiful to look at, and affirming to be with. It is true that it is women who raise, even to this day, the level of morality and decency in any place, in anywhere in the world, any, any people. As women live a noble life, they tend to pull the young men up to that level too, and they become life partners with them, these pillars of virtue and grace. And that's what one of our young women. And it is your job, I think, Derek, and along with the faculty, to do these four things to model with your lovely wife, Wendy, what it is to be a faithful man and a noble woman, to lead the faculty of men and women, to inculcate such gender clarity and biblical disciplines and graces into the life of the students who are here, to mentor strategically staff and students who will have the potential to be another Derek Halverson in just a few generations and to never lose sight of your end product, and that is men who lead a noble, faithful, and sacrificial life, and women who are full of grace and mercy and truth. I uh, count it a privilege to be your friend, and long after I'm not the moderator, I will be here to help you. And I speak for all the pastors in the BCA, how much we love you and are glad you're here, and God bless you and your work.
please remain standing. This morning's scripture reading begins with a passage from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. From the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning with chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Please be seated. We begin the official inauguration ceremony. And while you all are witnesses, and we appreciate every one of you here, to, we also have five special witnesses to witness the inauguration of Dr. Halverson, representing or actively participating the five last five presidents of Covenant College. I'd like to introduce to you, and as I introduce them, please stand. First of all, Dr. Robert S. Rayburn, whose class of 1972 is present. He's representing his father, Dr. Robert G. Raven, Rayburn, Covenants College's founding president. Dr. Rayburn served from 1955 to 1965, leading the college's move from Pasadena, California to St. Louis, and then in 1964 from St. Louis to Lookout Mountain. Mr. Philip Barnes, class of 1977, here to represent his father, Dr. Martin Barnes, Covenants second president. Dr. Barnes served from 1965 to 1978, overseeing the long process of accreditation, which Covenant received in 1971. The construction of Kresge Memorial Library and is known for his work in helping to improve Chattanooga through his work on the Air Pollution Control Board. Dr. Martin Essenberg, who was the third college president, is present. Dr. Essenberg served from 1978 to, to 1987. He saw the creation of a computer science center and the major and the major construction of Sanderson Hall and Dora McClellan Brown Memorial Chapel and the solidifying of a basic educational philosophy. Dr. Frank Brock, the fourth college president, is also present. Dr. Brock served from 1987 to 2002, deepening the college's connection to Chattanooga, overseeing the construction of Mills Hall and McClellan Reimer Hall and the growth in ac of academic programs, including the first graduate program. Lastly, Dr. Neil Nielsen, the fifth president of Covenant College, is also present. Serving from 2002 to 2012, Dr. Nielsen oversaw the creation of eight undergraduate majors and a master's program, the final drafting of a comprehensive philosophy of education, and the construction of Andre Andreas Hall, Brock Hall, and Dottie Brock Gardens. I'm going to ask you all five, would you please stand again? This is the history of Covenant College. I'm going to ask Dr. Halverson as he'd step forward, and I will ask him the questions of installation. Do you acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, inerrant in the original writings, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Do you sincerely believe and adopt the doctrinal standards of Covenant College as embodying the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? I do. Do you believe that you've been induced to seek the office of president of this college from the love 
from love to God and a sincere desire to promote his glory and the gospel of his son? I do. Do you willingly assume the responsibilities of the president of this college in agreement with your declaration when you accepted its call? And do you promise to discharge the duties of the office as God shall give you strength? I do. I present to you the sixth president of Covenant College, Dr. Derek Halverson. Remain standing, please, as we address ourselves to God. <laughs> Holy Father, it is on such occasions as this that we are especially conscious of what you have taught us in your word to call the cloud of witnesses. These we understand to be they who have gone before us, who have bequeathed to us our spiritual inheritance and who are represented in Holy Scripture as cheering us on, urging us to remain faithful to the example they set for us. Covenant College is still a very young institution as American colleges go, but with my mother's death this past Monday, only a very few remain who have any recollection of that first year in Pasadena. 1955. I among them, even if mine are but the fleeting memories of a little child. Here we are 62 years later, California and St. Louis far behind us now, Presidents Rayburn and Barnes in heaven, Presidents Essenberg and Brock in retirement, President Nielsen undertaking a new assignment, and now comes Dr. Halverson as the sixth, standing amid the cloud of witnesses. We commend him to you, Heavenly Father, Sovereign Lord. We commend to you the college under his leadership. There is so much to be thankful for, so much to admire, so much in which to take a proper pride in the life and work of our college as it is now placed in Dr. Halverson's hands. And are we not right to expect great things from you through him? But darkness is descending upon our beloved land. The church loses influence by the day. Her enemies grow bolder. Surely great challenges lie ahead. But when has it not been so for the institutions of the kingdom of God in Satan's world? Give, O oh Father, to Dr. Halverson the grace of the full measure of your Holy Spirit, that he may have the wisdom, patience, and courage this calling will require of him. Prove your grace, power, and faithfulness to him day after day. Make him to know that he is serving and walking with Almighty God. For what else shall we ask you on Dr. Halverson's behalf? So little do we know what the future holds. So little can we anticipate the challenges to come. But surely if he serves, if he leads so as to honor the cloud of witnesses, all will be as it ought to be. So this is our prayer for him. When he is summoned to take his place before the judgment seat, to give an account, as the apostle says, of the deeds done in the body, may he hear the longed for salutation of our Redeemer, well done, good and faithful servant, and may he also hear the heartfelt applause of those first generations of Covenant College who now with perfect hearts can rejoice in all that he did here for the honor of Jesus Christ, the advancement of the kingdom of the King of Kings. 
So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. You all may be seated. Covenant College trustees and advisors, um, President Nielsen, President Brock, President Essenberg, uh, Mr. Barnes, and Dr. Rayburn, distinguished guests, friends, family, faculty, and especially students and alumni, I thank you for being here today for this celebration of Covenant College and the Lord's faithfulness to it. It's a tremendous privilege and honor to be called to serve as Covenant's sixth president. And I want to thank the Presidential Search Committee and the Board of Trustees for entrusting me with this weighty responsibility. I'd also like to thank the Covenant family for so, welcoming, so warmly welcoming my family uh, back to Lookout Mountain. And I'd like to thank the Presidential Inauguration Committee and the other faculty and staff of the college who have worked so diligently to prepare uh, for this week's events. Uh, Mr. Moore told the board yesterday it's not quite like launching a space shuttle, but it's close. I'm grateful for your labors. Wendy and I greatly appreciate those who have served to make this day possible. And there are others I should thank as well. Uh, while this day marks um, an inauguration, a new beginning for Covenant College and for me, uh, we all know that within the created order, new beginnings do not come ex nihilo, out of nothing. I'm indebted to a number of people for making this new beginning possible. Uh, with respect to Covenant in particular, I want to thank and publicly applaud uh, my predecessors for their able leadership in the preceding decades of the college's existence. It's a delight uh, to be called on the sure foundation that you've established. And my path into this role has been shaped by the influence and investment of many people, some of whom are here today. I'm deeply indebted to my parents, uh, Marnie and Steve Halverson. Among her many other admirable qualities, my mom is faithful and persevering and forgiving, and whatever inclinations I show toward those traits are to be credited to her. Uh, my dad is zealous for the faith, a man with an active mind who loves theology and the Word of God um, from which it springs. Um, whatever inclinations I show in those directions, I owe to him. Uh, my dad also taught me to love the Green Bay Packers, um, so that's his fault as well. I'm indebted to my three brothers, uh, Hans, Kurt, and Hoyt, all Covenant alumni. Growing up in a house of four boys taught me a lot about teamwork and competition and getting along with fallen human beings. Um, each of them taught me invaluable lessons about discipline and service and fun. And for those of you who know the three of them, you can guess which one taught me which of those things. Uh, Dr. Lou Voskel, Emeritus Professor of History here at Covenant College, inspired me as an undergraduate to consider a calling in higher education. And as Professor Foreman mentioned already, I wanted to be like him when I grew up. Uh, dear and lasting college friends, have walked faithfully alongside me, offering counsel and correction and encouragement since our days of living together on the second floor of Carter Hall, on a hall whose name I will not mention for the sake of uh, preserving my reputation among this assembly of august guests. Uh, the late Professor Heiko Obermann put me through the intellectual ringer in the Division for Late Medieval and Reformation Studies at the University of Arizona, but also introduced me to the beauties of excellence in historical scholarship an introduction that was expanded on by my dissertation supervisor, Father Robert Byerly of Loyola University Chicago, who honors me today with his presence here. And I'm indebted to my wife, Wendy, uh, more than I could ever express <clears throat> in an inaugural address. But I'll say publicly that she's taught me precious lessons and priceless lessons about passion for the truth and passion for Jesus Christ and real self-denial for the sake of his kingdom. I've also learned from my children, Banks and Whitman, who've taught me both patience and how to look at the world with wonder and joy. And I have other debts, too, uh, too many to mention here, to teachers and schools and friends and roommates and coaches and pastors and bosses. Uh, and these debts are all indicative of lessons I've learned along my path, and those lessons have shaped me and brought me to this place. So today marks a new beginning uh, for me and my family and also a new beginning for Covenant College. And these new beginnings take place in an institutional context that is, in the grand narrative history of higher education in the Western world, new. Uh, folks at the universities of Paris and Bologna and Oxford like to bicker about whose is the oldest university. And regardless of which side you take in that debate, 
all three of those institutions are approaching their 1,000th birthday. In a little over three decades, Harvard College will celebrate its 400th birthday. And Covenant College is, in comparison, a very new institution. We were established in 1955. Uh, we came to this beautiful mountaintop location only in 1964. And at that point, there was just the old abandoned hotel. Some of the folks in this room helped the college move into the hotel. By the time I arrived at Covenant as a freshman, there were a few more buildings on campus, but this was still a relatively young or new college. Now there are more, more than twice as many buildings as when I came as a student. Um, there are a lot more new students, uh, remarkably gifted and committed new faculty, impressive new academic and co-curricular programs. There's a lot about Covenant that's new and vibrant and young and full of life and loaded with potential. Um, it's exciting, all of this newness. But I should tell you, um, as a historian, that we modern folks uh, tend to have an obsession with novelty. There's a lot that's appealing to us as 21st century Americans about the new. Things that are new, experiences that are new, um, we like new things. Um, but that infatuation with the new is new. Uh, at the dawn of a modern era, era the period that's uh, my own the focus of my own scholarly work, novelty was something to be avoided. It was a vice, not a virtue. John Calvin believed the intentional pursuit of novelty to be a failing of weak minds at best and evidence of human wickedness. For pre-modern Christians and even for the 16th century reformers in whose spiritual and intellectual lineage we stand at covenant, new things were not good. Old and ancient things were good. Um, I, as a historian, like old and ancient things. And so as excited as I am about this relatively new college and my new beginning here and the new people and initiatives here, I'd like this morning to look to and to celebrate the aspects of covenant that are not so new, that are old-fashioned, that might even be characterized as ancient. Um, and when I say that, I'm not referring to senior faculty. <laughs> you all heard in the first of the two scripture passages read, um, earlier, the prophet Jeremiah's admonition to the people of Israel. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. I want to talk today about ways in which covenant is walking in and should continue to walk in ancient paths because what we do here at covenant is in fact very old-fashioned and I think that's a good thing. I don't think that what we're engaged in here at Covenant could even, or I, I do think that what we're engaged in at Covenant could even be described as sort of a creative anachronism um, in education, both new and ancient at the same time. Now, when I start talking about ancient things, my wife begins to squirm. Um, when she first met me, I was trading foreign currencies in Chicago um, for one of the nation's largest banks on the 27th floor of the Sears Tower. By all accounts, I had a potentially lucrative career in front of me. And I told Wendy that I wanted to quit my job and go to graduate school and study medieval history. Um, and when I did that, she responded gently um, with some concern. Um, her initial fear was that I was going to start dressing in armor and jousting on the front lawn and moonlighting at medieval times. Um, I assured her that I was thinking of something more along the lines of a tweed jacket with elbow patches and a pipe and the occasional research trip to London or Paris, um, which assuaged her fears. Um, the, the creative anachronism that we're engaged in at Covenant is a little more profound than that which takes place at Renaissance fairs. Um, the new side of this combination, combination or anachronism is, of course, related to Covenant's relative youth and to some of these exciting new developments at the college that I mentioned earlier. Um, gifted and growing body of new students, talented new faculty and staff, new academic programs, new athletic programs, new facilities, new technologies, etc. The anachronism, or ancientness, probably merits further explanation, um, and in my view, it falls under two headings, academic and theological. What happens here at Covenant is, and should be, academically old-fashioned. It harkens back to the pre-modern college and university, to an era that had a different vision for the end purpose of higher education than is common today. What we know today as colleges and universities grew out of the monastic schools of the Middle Ages. For centuries, the collegiate paradigm was shaped by the religious and communal character of those early schools. In the late 1800s, with the rise of modernist individualism and of secular scientific worldviews, a new model became dominant in higher education, that of the research university. Now, I want you to know that 
research universities are good at some things, like research, um, and they're not so good at other things. Um, these institutions abandon the notion of an education that would shape whole persons, and it would do so via an academic community that cultivated and practiced particular Christian virtues, such as humility, self-denial, friendship, and charity. Instead, the new research universities of the late 19th century celebrated the making of knowledge by individuals, and virtues such as productivity, calculation, control, ambition, rationalism. Now, some of those modern values are not wrong in and of themselves, but their combination in the research university does not provide for the sort of educational context in which whole Christian persons are intentionally formed. That's not to say that individuals don't get shaped by their university experiences, but it's not a purposeful shaping with a particular end in mind. The best scholarship on higher education shows clearly that the research university model is not the best model for intentional, transformational education. By contrast, the old or ancient model, the small residential liberal arts college, similar in many respects to the monastic schools or academies of medieval and early modern eras, is a good model for shaping whole persons. In fact, Alexander Aston, professor emeritus of education at UCLA and one of America's leading scholars of higher education, argues that the residential liberal arts college is the best model for delivering transformational education. So transformational education, education that's not simply about the transmission of data from one brain to another, not just about the accumulation of facts or the awarding of credentials, but that's concerned for the shaping of whole Christian persons is exactly what we're after at a place like Covenant. And this approach is perfectly in keeping with Paul's instruction to the early church in Rome, which we heard in the second passage read earlier. Now, many of you are, who are here today will know the general outline of the book of Romans and will remember that this passage is sort of the hinge passage in that book. After laying out God's glorious plan of salvation over the first 11 chapters of his letter, Paul concludes with this wonderful and famous doxology of oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Uh, Paul's clearly euphoric in this passage about God's saving work in Jesus Christ. There are exclamation points in the text. And frankly, you probably feel, I certainly feel like you could sort of stop right there. What more needs to be said? And yet Paul doesn't stop. Um, he turns in Romans 12.1 and begins to lay out the natural consequences of Christ's saving work in our lives. And here's what he says. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that, you, by, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul appeals in this passage to Christians, to the early Roman Christians, and to us, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And of course, when Paul says that, he doesn't just mean bodies. Um, John Calvin pointed out that this is a synecdoche, that's for all of the English majors in the room, um, where a part represents the whole. And that Paul is urging Christians to give the whole of their selves, their entire person, the totality of which they're composed, as a living sacrifice. Um, and Paul says in the Greek that this is only logikos, this is only logical worship, a logical response in light of what God's done for us. And how do we accomplish the presentation of our whole selves as a living sacrifice? When Verse 2, Paul says that we're to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Um, literally, the Greek says that we're to be metamorphed. And for folks who don't remember their high school biology class, let me refresh you with a, a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, which says that metamorphosis means a change, quote, in form, shape, or substance, especially transformation by supernatural means, a complete change in the appearance, circumstances, condition, or character of a person, etc. End quote. Now, that's a pretty comprehensive change that Paul's talking about, and it begins with the renewing of our minds, our intellect. So the path that we tread um, or walk, the task that we undertake at a place like Covenant College, and what happens at many of the other institutions represented in this room, 
is one that's unmistakably intellectual or academic. And yet it is or has to be more than just academic. It has to be intellectual and it has to affect the transformation of the whole person so that whole persons can be presented to God as a living sacrifice. This goal or purpose for education is ancient or old-fashioned or anachronistic. We desire that our students would be shaped, changed, metamorphed comprehensively for the good through their curricular and extracurricular activities in the college. And so the model for our education, fittingly, is ancient. We are and ought to be a small college that values personal interaction between students and faculty and between students and other students. We ought to be a place that celebrates intellectual and spiritual discipleship. Ours ought to be a vibrant learning community. The ethos of our community ought to be characterized by the same spiritual virtues that characterize the earliest colleges and that animate many of the other colleges represented today. We are, after all, not only about the transmission of data and the development of skills, though that's certainly a part of what we do at Covenant. We're about the shaping of whole, thoughtful, purposeful, discerning Christian persons who can function and thrive in a complex world as they pursue God-given callings in both ordinary and extraordinary places, bringing glory to God and benefit to those around them. I want to add that while this model is perhaps anachronistic, um, it's becoming increasingly popular as educators in the public become aware of the failures, the weaknesses of the research university model. Um, that's, this is the reason why Vanderbilt is building new residential colleges. Um, and so uh, to have Princeton and Rice and Ole Miss recently built residential colleges. So for those, who, those of us who are at small residential colleges, it's nice to be ahead of the curve for once. Uh, Covenant is, in important respects, academically old-fashioned. Now, because of our commitment to an educational path that shapes lives and not just fills brains with facts, we employ an educational model um, bent toward that end that's ancient and time-tested. But the ancientness doesn't stop there. In addition, we are and ought to be theologically old-fashioned. We're an, we as an institution affiliated with the Presbyterian Church in America are rooted in the tradition of, Pro, of the Protestant reformers of the 16th century, uh, specifically those of the Scottish persuasion, though one would have to admit that we've borrowed quite a bit from our brothers and sisters of the continental branch of the Reformation. Despite some hype a few years ago about John Calvin, the comeback kid, which was an article on Christianity Today, it would be difficult to deny that ours is an old and out-of-fashion tradition. However, that tradition defines in very important ways who we are as an institution and as a community. Uh, historian George Marsden has outlined some of the ways, um, or some of these ways, in an essay entitled Reformed and, and American, where he identifies three emphases that have been characteristic of Reformed Christianity in America. The doctrinalist emphasis, the pietist emphasis, and the culturalist emphasis. All three of these emphases can be found on Covenant's campus today. And one of my prayers is that we'll continue to champion all three. Passion for truths of Scripture, fervent, Christ-centered piety, and the desire to bring the good news of the cosmic, redeeming work of Christ and the truth of His Word to bear on every aspect of the culture in which we live. There's a natural human tendency to exalt one of these emphases over the other, as anyone knows a bit of church history can tell you. However, we ought to be a place where all three are maintained in fruitful tension by virtue of their being rooted in our love for Christ. And as those of you who are part of the Reformed tradition know, um, while it's an old tradition, um, it's still very much alive. And it's another of my prayers for covenant that it would remain so here. I have no interest in falling into what Yaroslav Pelikan has defined as traditionalism, the dead faith of the living. I long for covenant to cling to a tradition, what Pelican calls the living faith of the dead, one that's been handed down faithfully by our forefathers. But how does this happen? How do we ensure that ours remains a living tradition? Well, we can one, glean one critical piece of guidance from the great Dutch theologian and statesman Abraham Kuyper, who famously declared that stress in creedal confession without drinking from the living fountain runs dry in barren orthodoxy. Without a focus on Jesus Christ, the living fountain, without him as the centerpiece of our mission and him as the source of our motivation and strength, 
we will quickly become advocates of a dry, wooden, dead tradition. Yaroslav Pelikan is again helpful when he writes that tradition is like an icon that points beyond itself. We look at it, but also through it and beyond it to the reality it represents. We at Covenant ought to value the good gift that is our tradition, and we ought to seek to hold to its attendant emphases in fruitful tension, but we must remember that it points beyond itself to the matchless Savior and Lord of all and to his truth delivered to us in Scripture. I think this is part of why I like Covenant's motto so much, um, in all things Christ preeminent. Our embrace of our living tradition with its doctrinalist and pietist and culturalist streams will be fruitful and nourishing to us and to our witness in the world so long as Christ is exalted as preeminent in all things. When we drink from the living fountain, we will bear fruit. And when we stop, we will become barren. And so as I join the covenant family in this new endeavor, and as we consider the promise of a new beginning, I would point us back to an ancient path, to the old-fashioned, anachronistic nature of our project, both in terms of the form it takes academically and in terms of the foundation upon which it rests theologically. Let us be ancient even as we are new. Even in our youth, let us walk the ancient path because it's a path with purpose. Let us be a small residential college of the liberal arts and sciences that takes seriously the transformation of students in every respect accomplished through faithful academic rigor and an ethos of humility and self-denial and friendship and love. Let us be a college that cherishes its theological heritage, one that loves sound doctrine and that values warm piety and that brings the truths of Scripture to bear on every aspect of life and culture. Let us be a college that's animated by a theological tradition that's alive. Alive because it's based on and rooted in and points to the one who is the source of all life. Let us be a college that seeks to honor in the way we pursue our scholarship, in the way we live together, in the way we serve the church and the world. The Christ who, as Paul tells us in Colossians 1, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the sustainer of all things, the firstborn from the dead, the reconciler of all things. For in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is our living fountain. He is our life. St. Augustine famously described God as being a God of eternal beauty ever ancient, ever new. Would that this, our, this God, our God, ever ancient and ever new, be glorified as we tread an ancient path with a distinct purpose, equipping and inspiring generations of men and women to explore and express the preeminence of Jesus Christ in all things. Thank you. Please rise for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or think according to his power that's at work in us, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through every generation, now and forevermore. Amen.